This video follows immediately on the heels of the previous video. So in the last video, we made this firing rate map. And now in this video, we are going to make a map of orientation tuning. So the question here is whether neurons that are physically close to each other, so either recorded from the same electrode or neighboring electrodes, whether those neurons also have similar orientation tuning. So we're gonna start by computing the preferred orientation tuning of each neuron, just like we did a few videos ago. And then we are going to create a matrix that's a little bit like this, except instead of the average number of action potentials, we are going to enter the number of degrees of the preferred orientation into that matrix and then visualize it. And that's going to look something like this. Now, you might be thinking that this possibly isn't exactly the best way to visualize these data. In fact, there are two problems with this plot. And if you would like to pause the video and see if you can come up with the two issues that we have here, then feel free to do so. So here's the two problems with this plot. One is that stimulus gradient is circular, which means that 360 degrees and zero degrees are actually the same. However, this is a linear color scale, and so zero degrees and 360 degrees have polar opposite colors. And the second problem is that we know from uh, the previous video that not all of these physical electrodes have neurons, and furthermore, not every neuron gave more than one action potential. So electrodes that have neurons that didn't fire at all, or no neurons, are actually colored here as if they are tuned to zero degrees, which isn't really appropriate. Okay, so we're gonna solve both of those problems by using a different function for the visualization and by using an alternative and more appropriate color map. And that's going to look like this. So you can see that this color map has the same colors for zero, 180, and 360, and the same colors for 90 degrees and 270 degrees. And furthermore, you can see that any grid locations that has zero spikes are now shown as empty or white instead of being mapped, incorrectly mapped, onto a color that's already in this color scale here. Okay, so this is our goal, and now we can switch to MATLAB. A lot of the code for this video looks similar to the code from the previous video, so I'm going to give you the bird's eye view of the code here, and then we'll go back and we'll start filling in the details. So we start by extracting the data that we need out of our big three-dimensional data matrix that we've been working with. And here you can see that we are creating the data matrix. We're looping over all the physical channels, so the physical electrodes. We're finding uh, which neurons were present on this electrode and so on. So this is really similar to the previous video. And then we're gonna do some visualization, some imaging. And that again, looks pretty similar to what we had in the previous video. Okay, but of course the devil's in the details. So let's get started with filling in this code. So now instead of getting the total number of, or the average number of action potentials over all of these stimulus orientations, here we want to have the average separated per orientation. So we want the average of total spike count over, and now this one is going to be averaging over the third dimension, and we want to average over trials, that's the third dimension, and now we want to keep this as a matrix of neurons by orientation. Then the next step is to find out what is the maximum response, so the maximum number of average action potentials for each of those neurons over the 12 different orientations. So this line of code should look familiar, from a few videos ago. There we did it for one neuron, and here we are doing it for all 106 neurons, all at the same time. Again, this is an example of something that you could put into a for loop and run this code, this max function, separately for each neuron, but it's not necessary to do it in a for loop. We can do it all at once by inputting a matrix into the max function and specifying which dimension MATLAB should compute the average or the, the maximum value over. So we want the, to find the maximum over the second dimension, which is the orientation. Okay, and then, so let's see. So again, this gives us the maximum response for each neuron and the stimulus orientation at which the maximal response was observed. 
Now this orientation is in indices and we can convert it here into degrees using this variable, this vector, gradient orient, which was just the list of stimulus orientations in this experiment. Okay, so now we get this max response. So this tells us that the that neuron number one, so the first neuron in this data set, had a maximum response, maximum neural firing rate response to a stimulus with 120 degrees and so on for all the other neurons. Okay, let's see. So we're going to uh, initialize the orientation map. This looks pretty similar to uh, what we had in the previous video. Maybe we'll have to get back to that line in a minute. And then let's see, we're looping over all of the channels and we're finding which uh, units, actually I, I renamed this in the previous video, I called this which units instead of which chance because this is telling us which units, which neurons are present on each of these channel locations. Okay, and then that gets converted into, uh, or then we, we identify the row and column indices, just like in the previous video. And this also looks really similar to the previous video, except for the variable name. Here we're getting the maximum response. And in the previous video, we got the average number of action potentials. Now I'm just gonna run all of this code and see what it gives us. Okay, now you remember that in the previous video, I actually made a mistake. I made a coding mistake that wasn't planned. It just happened. And, but I discovered my mistake by inspecting the data carefully before going any further. So let's do that again here. Let's inspect this data, huh? Now I expect this to be a 10 by 10 matrix, but in fact, it's just a single number. So let's confirm this. I'm gonna type whose orientation map. And indeed, this is really just a single number. So it turns out that the problem here is that we don't have any indexing into this matrix. So in fact, it's just getting, you know, each iteration in this for loop, it's just getting overwritten by whatever is the maximum response from you know this particular neuron. Okay, so the solution here is to add row call. So here we identify the row and column indices, and here we can use those as indices into orientation map. So let's run all this again. And okay, so this is looking better in the sense that it's a matrix. However, if I type whose and look at this, the size of this. Now I see that it is nine by eight. And that's a little weird. I expected this to be 10 by 10. It should be 10 by 10. So let, let's see what's happening here. Well, if we look up here where we initialize the output matrix, it says that we should initialize this as NANs for not a number. But in fact, we're just initializing this as, you know, as, as a, a vector of two elements corresponding to the size of map. So this is not correct. In fact, we're missing the function call NAN. Now we get a 10 by 10 matrix of all NANs. And finally, that gives us the right answer. So now you can see that we get a bunch of numbers where there are valid data points. And we also have NANs here where there are no valid data points. So these are places where there were no neurons or where the neuron had a zero firing rate. Now I'm going to show you in a few minutes why I initialize this as NAN instead of initializing it as zeros, as I did with this uh, firing rate map in the previous video. Okay, so let's start by just having a look at these data. So put this in the second subplot and we're gonna make an image of this orientation map. And yeah, some of this stuff is the, some of this code here is the same as uh, in, the, in, in the previous video. Okay, so I mentioned in the slides at the beginning of this video, we have two problems here. So let's solve the first one. The first one is that we have circular data, uh, but this is a linear color map. So we need to fix this problem so that the color wraps around from 360 to zero. And in fact, the way I wrote the code, it's gonna wrap around twice in here. So we get zero and 180 and 360 are all going to have the same color. Now, MATLAB has built-in circular color maps that we can use. So we can type color map HSV, that's one of the uh, uh, built-in color maps. But I am not so happy about this. One thing is that it changed the color map for the entire figure, including this axis, and I was already happy with the previous color map, how it was before. And also, I wanna change these colors, so it's not so many different colors here, not so many distinct colors. So I'm gonna create my own bimodal color map here. 
So I'm going to specify a color map from copper. So this is going to be the copper color map. And then I'm going to have the color map. And this 16 just means it's 16 discretizations of the color space. So notice what I'm doing here. I'm concatenating the color map C. So these are the RGB channels. So that's the number of columns corresponds to red, green, and blue channels, saturation. And then I'm flipping that matrix. So flip UD is for flip up, down. And then I have the... Uh, that matrix again, and then I'm flipping it again. So this is going to give me a color map that goes from zero to, so here you can see the copper part here, it goes from zero up to, in this case, five, or in this case, about 90. And then it's going backwards and then forwards and then backwards again. So we're wrapping around twice so that we get zero, 180 and 360 degrees all in the same color. Okay, so that deals with one problem. And uh, actually, we still have this issue that it, it changed both of the color maps. So let me change, let's see, I'll change the color map back to hot because I was happy with color map hot for the left one. And now I'm going to add color map. I'm going to specify the first input as GCA for get current axis. So that's going to access this color map over, or this axis here. This is the last one we've worked with. And it's only going to change the color map for this axis and not for this axis. Okay, now we still have one more problem here, which is that all of these cells in this matrix that have no data are colored as if they are a value of zero or 180 or 360. So this is just the way that image SC works. So to resolve this issue, I'm going to use a different MATLAB function, which is called pcolor. There are a few distinctions between pcolor and image SC, but the main distinction that we are interested in here is that image SC will still color NANs as if they are the lowest value in your color map, but pcolor will just ignore those colors and won't uh, display those pixels. So we want to make a pcolor of orientation map and then let's see how all of this looks. So I'm also adding some X and Y axis labels that I didn't specify uh, in uh, on this uh, spatial map, but of course you can just copy and paste these two lines of code here. Now this changed the color map back to hot. So I want to rerun this line of code. I think I will just copy and paste that in here. And there we go. So that concludes our first module for this course. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you found it fun and a little bit challenging and also educational. In the online resources for this course where you downloaded the MATLAB code and the data set, there is also a PDF that contains some suggestions for optional exercises. So if you would like to continue working with these data and working with the code, then please check out that PDF. Otherwise, I will see you in the next module.